Link, you are the light. Our light. That must shine upon Hyrule once again. Now go. February 21st, 1986. For many, this was just like any other Friday, but it also was the release of The Legend of Zelda, a game made for the Famicom that would be the birth of a beloved franchise. The game stood out not only gameplay-wise, but also through its beginning. By throwing you into the world with minimal information, it created an authentic exploration experience that you would not get from titles such as Super Mario Bros. But one thing about the original Zelda game that made it so memorable and unique was its tutorial. Or to be more specific, lack of tutorial. Back in the early days of the gaming industry, it was normal to put players right in the beginning of the game with minimal context. But most of these other games still played at a linear pace. The Legend of Zelda went a step further by creating one of the earliest open-world experiences filled with secrets to entice the player to explore to their heart's desire. The reason this was possible was because of how simple games used to be. In the early days of gaming, there were minimal controls and the player would mostly learn themselves or from video game manuals. As both technology and the gaming industry progressed, this form of entertainment became much more complicated with more controls and a richer gaming experience. But this also meant that the games had become less of a pick-up-and-play convenience due to the player not having enough knowledge to enjoy it without getting frustrated. Because of this, plenty of these games would integrate tutorials that would help teach the player of a certain game mechanic or element so they can play the game with the knowledge needed. The biggest problem with many of these tutorials, though, is the fact that they are forced onto the player. While it might help someone new to the game, it becomes a burden for someone who is either replaying the game or already knows the basics from previous titles. Some games will give you the option to do tutorials, but that can still take you out of the immersion, especially when certain characters break the fourth wall just to tell you what button to press on your controller. Breath of the Wild is different, though. Not only does it make a great tutorial, it tricks you into thinking that you aren't even in one. In today's episode of the documentary of Breath of the Wild, we are going to look at what makes Breath of the Wild's tutorial great, and how it succeeds compared to other games. While this game uses a variety of tricks to create a well-designed tutorial, I've broken it down into five things. Pacing, self-learning, open world, immersion, and simplicity. Pacing is really what it sounds like. It's how the game delivers its tutorial through elements such as cutscenes and other characters. For example, a cutscene in the prologue may solely exist to force you into a fight where the game teaches you how to play. Some characters within a game may also be put in situations where they are only there to teach the player how the game works, sometimes even breaking the fourth wall. These are quick and easy ways to educate someone on the gameplay mechanics so they don't get stuck later on. But at the same time, this is also one of the most annoying approaches to creating a tutorial. This is because someone who already knows how to play the game will be forced to do the same tutorial for the 10th time. Breath of the Wild fixes this pacing problem because of a few key elements. One of them is the cutscenes, but it's not the inclusion of them, it is the lack of cutscenes. The game does have a few in the tutorial, but they all serve some sort of purpose. There's never a point where it feels like they drag on for too long or make you feel disconnected from the world. One Zelda game that is known for its super long beginning is Twilight Princess, and most of that comes from the pacing. That and the fact that you have to do a lot of missions that are irrelevant to the main quest to begin with. I mean, what would you rather do? This? Or this? In one of my theory videos, I had also briefly discussed Kingdom Heart 2's infamous tutorial that can take hours to finish. And while some say that the slow beginning was necessary for the story, it doesn't change the fact that its pacing was, well, slow. Breath of the Wild's pacing does not suffer at all, and to be honest, that's because there is no designated pace. You can play the tutorial however you want, which is something that really makes the game stand out especially against other installments in the franchise. Remember when I talked about how each cutscene feels relevant to the game? Well, for an example, let's look at the moment the Great Plateau Tower rises. It might seem insignificant at first, but this whole cinematic was executed brilliantly. Having the player activate the tower only to see more rise informs them that these are important landmarks that the 
player should find, even more so by then filling up a part of Hyrule's map. The game is able to both inform the player that these towers are important, as well as explain why they should go out of their way to activate them, and it is done in a very quick and effective way. This idea sort of leads into the next reason that the game succeeds in its tutorial. Self-learning. It's basically what it sounds like, when you can figure out how to play without having the game hold your hand. This can work, but the problem usually occurs once you realize that a lot of games will just give you the answer to a puzzle or challenge without you having to learn through trial and error. Sometimes it's so bad that the entire game can feel like one big tutorial. It makes games very easy and unrewarding. So what is an example of a game that pulls this trick off? Let's look at Super Mario Bros for the NES. This game is a great example of the self-learning method. When you start playing this game, it puts you right into the first level 1-1. If you notice, at the start, there is nothing on your screen aside from your character. The lack of enemies or platforms is purposely done so the player can use the space to get used to the controls and what they do. This is where they might learn how to jump as well as move Mario. Move a bit more to the right and now you are faced with the most common enemy of the game. A single Goomba. If this is your first playthrough, you may nonchalantly walk up to the creature not expecting anything to happen. But then you die. This now tells you, okay, I am supposed to avoid these things. You start the level again, but this time you jump over the creature. There's something else you might have not noticed, however. There are blocks in the same area the Goomba is located, so in the middle of jumping over the enemy, you may accidentally strike one of these blocks. That now teaches you that you can jump up and hit them. So while you learn to avoid the Goomba, it also manages to show you another gameplay mechanic. And with this knowledge, the player will now notice the blocks with the question marks on them and think, I wonder what happens when I hit them. This then follows up with them learning about power-ups and the process continues. Now let's take a look at Breath of the Wild. Before you leave the shrine, there is one obstacle that blocks you from the outside. Because you have nowhere to go but forward, you approach the wall. This is when the game tells you to move forward while hitting the X button. And before you know it, you are climbing the wall and can leave the shrine. Congratulations! You now know how to transverse through Breath of the Wild's world. This is definitely the most notable example of how the self-learning process works in the game. This whole method of teaching the player is seen not only through the tutorial, but the whole game in general. It works very well because it doesn't have to force anything onto the player and gives them a sense of accomplishment even when they perform the most simple of tasks. This isn't saying that the game doesn't help you at all though. A lot of the time, it will give you useful advice and show you how to do things but it's done in a subtle yet effective way. Other games might interrupt your play session just to teach you a simple mechanic, which takes you out of the experience, but not in this game. Anytime a tip or piece of useful advice is given to you, it is in the form of a text box that rarely stops your gameplay. If you enter a place that is too hot or too cold for Link, the game will briefly inform you about it while still letting you play. It makes it a lot better than having someone such as Navi always around to tell you the stuff you already were aware of. But this is made even better since the game only gives you these hints when it is necessary. A lot of games might try dumping all the combat or platforming controls on you at once, which will just overwhelm and confuse the player. But in this game, that never happens. You only will learn how to use a bow once you actually get your first bow. This also means that you can play the game for the fourth time and still learn something new. It doesn't only benefit the tutorial, but the entire gaming experience. A great example is when I found out that you can not only use Cryonis on Water Blight's ice blocks, but also launch them back with stasis. And that wasn't even through my own playthrough. I was watching someone else stream it. One of the best explanations for how this self-loading strategy is pulled off brilliantly comes from another Nintendo channel called Arlo. He explains the process of how he learnt several core mechanics in the game without it specifically telling him what to do. And I'm heading for one, and I see that it goes too high up in the mountains, and things start getting cold. So I'm looking up there, and I'm just like, oh man, I I don't think I can do this. I don't, I don't know what I would do. I'm I'm trained in a Zelda game to assume that I have to come back later, that I need an item. But then I'm fighting some guys that are near the cold place, and uh, there's these peppers. There's these peppers down on the ground, and you know, you, I grab them and I read the description, and it's just like, oh, it can be made into a thing that helps stave off the cold. Okay, oh, okay, you can hold multiple ingredients at once. You can just put stuff in your hand. Oh my gosh, look at that. You just throw it in now. You put it in your hand and you throw it in. I figured out how to cook all on my own, and it was so satisfying because not only did I figure out how to cook, 
that was me also figuring out how to get up into the cold area. I definitely say that this is the main reason why the Great Plateau is such a great starting point for the game. Speaking of the plateau, the next reason the tutorial works is because of number three, the open world. Having a game with a tutorial that eventually leads to an open world is one thing, but having the tutorial itself be a part of that open world is a whole other story. And you soon realize that this isn't like any other game the moment you step out of the shrine. And after that, you can play however you want. Don't be fooled, this is still a tutorial since you can't leave it until you get the paraglider, but at no point do you realize it. Of course, you still have to do a few things here to proceed in this tutorial, but this is easily worked around by letting the player do whatever they want until Zelda instructs them on where to go. But that doesn't mean that you have to follow her instructions right away. You can still go wherever you want and take in your surroundings. But once you do activate the tower, you then have to go to the four shrines. There isn't any way around this. But it utilizes the open world by letting you complete them in whatever order you desire. It feels a lot more natural, and once again lets you set your own pace when playing. Also, while in other Zelda games you would gradually get new items which in return allows you to solve new puzzles or get to new locations, all runes necessary for the main game are given to you at the very start. Once you leave the plateau, you have everything you need to solve any and all puzzles in the game. This works well with the open world aspect and does not restrict you with what you can do. If I were to best explain why this all makes the tutorial great, it's like you are playing a mini version of the game. It still has all of the game mechanics and parts of the full version, just restricted to a single region. I'll be talking a lot more about the open world and freedom it gives in a later episode. But one of the biggest problems with tutorials is the fact that they take you out of the gameplay experience. So how exactly does this game keep that immersion? I'd say that it comes from a couple things. First of all, everything you are forced to do before leaving the plateau is actually relevant to the story. Yeah, you have to activate the Great Plateau Tower if you want to proceed through the game. But as mentioned previously, this also teaches a player to look out for these towers and activate them when they can. The same can be said for shrines. By forcing them onto the player at the beginning, it trains them to complete these mini dungeons whenever they come across one in the world. Not only that, but it uses the four shrines on the plateau as a way to give the player a new rune, along with teaching them how it works with the puzzle centered around that one ability. But this isn't forgotten about later on. You will always find a reason to use one of these runes in the world, whether it be collecting a treasure chest or solving a puzzle in a dungeon. You also get the spirit orbs which end up being essential to your journey, as they let you increase your health and stamina. There's never a point where you really question why you have to go to these shrines. This sense of immersion also works since characters never break the fourth wall to teach you certain moves or controls. While it can be funny in certain situations, it is an easy way to take a player out of their experience. I don't want a character to tell me what button to press on my controller to swing a sword. I've already mentioned the fact that the game stays immersive because no tutorials are forced down your throat. But there is one occasion where this applies and Nintendo manages to keep the player in the game. There's a shrine in Kakariko Village that teaches you the basics of fighting by placing you in a staged battle. But this works well for a few reasons. First of all, the shrine can be done whenever you want, but it is strategically placed in a location you would most likely visit first. In any other Zelda game, this would be a fight that you would have to do at the beginning. So this lets you decide on if you want to do it or not. Second, even if it is a tutorial, it is also a shrine, meaning that upon completion you will get a spirit orb. It makes the fight feel less forced and more natural, since you are given an incentive to do it besides learning how to fight. Simplicity is the last topic I want to briefly touch on, and it plays a huge role in making an enjoyable tutorial. Now, simple doesn't equate to a game being bland or boring. It just means that Breath of the Wild is a lot less complicated than you think. Let's look at other Zelda games. There are many times where you might need a certain item to gain access to a new location, such as the hookshot or hover boots. The problem is that the more items that are like this, the more complicated the game gets. And a lot of these items are purposely restricted as to where they can be used, which as a result can get confusing. The same applies to when you can only climb on certain surfaces 
surfaces or shimmy around certain ledges. But Breath of the Wild throws that all away since you can climb anything and paraglide anywhere. Instead of having five different items that help navigate but can only be used if certain conditions are met, it's simplified to a few core mechanics. It means that less has to be learned by the player, which makes it feel like less of a hassle. In fact, most of the complexity of the game comes from keeping the whole thing simple. This idea in itself warrants a separate episode, so I may go further into it eventually. This is why I love the beginning of this game. It manages to perfect the mixture of immersion and teaching core elements to the player without them realizing it. I can safely say that as of now, this is the best beginning to a game I have ever experienced. And I hope I was able to convince you too. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to see more of this series, then make sure to subscribe and like the video. In the previous video, I covered the story of the game, so if you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check it out. See you guys in the next episode.